All right, Wesley Morris is here. This movie came out 40 years ago, summer of 1984. Um, Jesus Christ. I remember where I saw it in the movie theater. I made my dad take me in Cape Cod. It was just, it was the two of us, little father-son movie, and then uh, Apollonia, and it got got a little awkward with me sitting next to him. But um, <laughs> I don't even know where to start with this, but maybe we start here. Eddie Murphy, 1982. Michael Jackson, mm. 1983. Perfect way Prince, to start. Prince, 1984. We mm -hmm. go from the 81 era where Richard Pryor is like basically the only big market movie star where the Jeffersons and Different Strokes are the only TV shows that have black stars in the top like 40. And, you know, music's fine. But that, and then all of a sudden these three comments come in one year after the other. And I, not to be this person, but I, you also have to like spare a thought for uh, the Cosby show starting. Um, yeah, you're right. That that yeah, I, I, that, yeah, that could be 1985, because even though it launched in 84, 85 was when it really blew up. So yeah, and, there you go. And so on all, like basically the only reason to sort of say that is that there are all these prongs happening, right? All these entertainment prongs. And suddenly there are black men occupying most of them, right? TV, movies, music. Um, and they're all... Except for Bill Cosby, Prince Eddie Murphy and Michael Jackson, they're, I mean, there's something about their demeanors that isn't standard. Um, you know, Eddie might be a little confused about why we would be classifying him with Michael Jackson and Prince, but um, there's well, a kind a, of- But Eddie's doing, he's on still the biggest- sketch comedy show but then he's got movies coming out and there's he's just occupying this piece of turf as a 21 year old guy where we're like holy shit what's happening here right. i think with the with all three cases because michael and prince had been around prince had released albums michael had been around since he was a kid but in all three cases there was a holy shit moment where right. it just felt like right. each person was about to be the biggest star in the, of the decade and it happened year after year after year and, you know, it's funny because we're going to talk about Purple Rain, but but Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis are not in it. <laughs> right, because he bumped them out of the time. And while this movie's being made, well, maybe not while the movie's being made, but while it's while Purple Rain is Purple Rain Mania is happening, Jimmy and Terry are making control with Janet Jackson. You know, um, Whitney Houston's debut album comes out a year later. It's just, it's a really fascinating time. And the, there's an inflection point that's different from the 70s and Black people where it was, everything was still being classified as soul music or yeah. funk. Um, and what happens in the 80s is all of the so-called niches that Black music was being stuffed into exploded into mainstream popular culture. Um, and so... You know, all of the 70s priorities are present in Prince and in aspects of Michael Jackson. And, you know, the criticism against Whitney was that they were non-existent in her music, although she's bringing some other older traditions. Um, and then you've got, like, but the thing about Prince that is so exciting is, and, and it's hard to remember this now because everything he embodied in 1984 and 83 and, you know, the late 70s, is kind of normalized now. Um, nobody was calling him queer back then and meaning it in a positive way. <laughs> right. Um, and so his ideas of gender, his ideas of race, his ideas of self-presentation, they it was kind of standard in the 80s for people to look like Prince, but it wasn't by any means normal um, for what he was doing um, at all. You know, I was thinking about 84 and I remember writing about it for page two a million years ago, like just how, what a crazy year that was in all these different ways with sports and movies and music. I mean, that's the year Michael Jordan goes to the NBA. That's the year yep. Whitney starts taking off and the Cosby show. There's like a hundred things that happen, but Prince following Michael Jackson, because Thriller comes out near the end of 82, but 83 is the Michael Jackson year, right? That's when the yep. Motown special happens. That's when it just seems like he is the biggest music star we've had maybe since the Beatles. 
And yes. then Prince shows up a year later, even though he'd been there, but shows up with this music movie, which usually don't work. We grew up with like Elvis movies and Beatles movies. And this was a format that usually if you put a star at the front of a music movie, it was probably going to be bad. The acting was going to be bad. Maybe there's a couple good songs. And instead it goes the other way. And the album's amazing. The movie's amazing. The movie yeah. actually does well. You have MTV happening at the same time. Then Purple Rain became this HBO. I think it was on HBO for like three years straight. I think it was mm. just on Tuesday mm -hmm. at 10 mm -hmm. o'clock for that's, like five years in a row. That's how I watched it. I mean, I didn't yeah. experience it in the other way. But I, I don't know if there's ever been a better movie vehicle for a music star. I can't mm. think of one. Because like, uh, even like Blues Brothers, Greece, Travolta is not really a movie star, right? Chicago, that's a musical with actors. Walk the right. Line, that's Phoenix playing Johnny Cash. Star is Born has Christopherson and Bradley Cooper and maybe Lady Gaga and a Star is Born. But different it's nothing thing, like though. Prince. It's a different thing. If the the closest the closest thing that I can come up with is like a hard day's night, right? Mm. Like it's it's before Prince. It's the Beatles, basically. Um, the Beatles are the only band I and maybe the monkeys, right? Because the monkeys oh, but the monkeys sort of lived in this enclosed television universe. Yeah. And the songs were the engine for a lot of the episodes. But this this is different because the Beatles were already famous. They were already like globally famous when those movies come out. And they're trying to figure out how to take a thing that was electrifying um, on the records and especially in the concerts and to put it in movies, but they never did that, right? Those movies were never about the trying to capture the live experience of the Beatles. Well, and Those they also, they, they didn't last 40 years later where you could watch Purple Rain tomorrow and there's five or six scenes where you're just like, holy shit, is this the most talented person who has ever been on a stage? Right, right, right. And, and, and you know, in, in the case of Hard Day's Night, you know, you're giving yourself over to Richard Lester. Yeah. Um, and you get a sense of, like, how fun the Beatles are to be with. But Prince and Purple Rain, then, you know, to just, like, close this complete loop, Desperately Seeking Susan comes out the year a year later. Um. And that's a movie that's that's just about Madonna as a vibe, not Madonna as one of the biggest artists in the world, too. Right. Um, the thing that makes Purple Rain so extraordinary is there had never been successfully been because Dylan made, you know, Dylan's got a movie, um, Bob Dylan. Um, there are like David Bowie and Mick Jagger in the 70s acting in movies, but Pur Purple Rain is the first thing that is from start to finish the, the album that you were already listening to presented to you in movie form. With a plot it, that actually made sense with the songs. For, yeah. I, I mean, as well as we're going to do, like when he's playing beautiful <laughs> ones, he's playing beautiful ones and it actually like intersects with the, with the plot. Same for Darling Nikki, which I can't wait to talk about. So when we're talking about it compared to the other, I'm not calling this a musical, obviously, but music movies. No. Yes. And you have like the Chicago type of movie. You have mm -hmm. the Blues Brothers type of movie, right? Then you have like Grease. Then you have Walk the Line, which is like a biography or the Ray Charles movie that Jamie Foxx made. This movie isn't really like any of those. Mm -mm. And I, I don't mm -mm. even really know how to categorize it. And I think it kind of lives alone in its own space where it's like, I'm not sure this ever happens again, where you catch the right artist at the exact perfect point of his yeah. career, making the best album he's ever going to make. That's going to be about to become this phenomenon for nine months. And somehow they're just making a movie during all of this. I think the odds are like a hundred to one that this ever happens again. Eight Mile is the only thing I can think of that is doing. I mean, Eight Mile is Purple Rain, right? But Eminem, right? Um, but the thing about it is, it's a lie. You know, it's it's a. I mean, Purple Rain is lying too, but it's mythologizing the myth. The myths between Eminem and Prince are different, and the priorities are different. 
Yeah. Um, but it is about the myth of Eminem as being this particular kind of rapper, not the guy who would be sh Slim Shady, right? Like a serious, you know, I worked my ass off to win these rap battles and life was hard for me. And also, I'm not crazy. I'm not this. I don't. You would never have any idea that that Eminem was the other kind of great rapper he is based on yeah. Eight Mile. Prince, there's no secrets here. Like every inch of his artistry is on full, active, thrilling display in Purple Rain. And all you all you're thinking when you're leaving this movie is like, what is 1985 going to look like for this guy? <laughs> right. I was going to say, like, you could almost make a case that Apex Mountain is purple because that's how Apex Mountain-y yeah. Prince was <laughs> in, in Purple Rain. You know what else I wrote down? 2024 is the, it's the era of the hagiography, right? Like all the documentaries are produced yeah. by the people that made mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. We have these movies like the Elton John movie and the, and, uh, the Bob Marley movie. And that's just kind of where we're going. Like these sanitized. We're fully there. We're fully there. 1984, 40 years ago, Prince was like, fuck it. I'm going to play this com complex abusive, fucked up, narcissistic diva who mm -hmm. not that many people in the movie even really like him. And he's no. fucked up and he might be a waste of talent. And Prince is like, sign me up. That sounds great. <laughs> can I just absolutely crush like six scenes? Do I get to act? And can the last 15 minutes of the movie be one of the best concert films ever filmed? I and mean. then uh, that's in. Then we're, then we're off and we're ready to go. Questlove had this quote about how he thinks Purple Rain started hip hop culture, whether historians want to admit it or not. I thought it was ambitious. I thought it was a take, but he was basically saying you had the, the beef between Prince and the time. Um, you had just, this is basically hip hop, even though we didn't know what hip hop was yet. And just all of the pieces would eventually come. I don't know. I don't know if you have a take I, on that one. I hear, I hear that. Also, I mean, it's important to mention that in the background of all this happening is the um, like the the simmering of you know the most important musical format in the last or genre in the last fifty years. Right? right. Hip hop is 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 becoming important and it's already it's already extremely present in the lives of most you know lots of lots of people um and it's eventually during this period making its way onto the pop charts um so there's this other thing happening in the background um this other other major thing happening in the background but i don't right. know i feel like i hear i hear what i'd be curious to know when Questlove said that um as opposed to, I'm not. I'm inclined to agree with an i like an aspect of it, but it's not like there weren't. It's not like Cool Mo D or not Cool Mo D. The, that's a little bit later. It's not like like the Queens and Brooklyn rappers weren't already fighting over who invented the art form, right? right. Um, but I hear what he's saying in terms of localizing the the battle to a case of personality disagreements. Right, different styles of 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 self presentation, sexuality, um, stage presence. Um, well, let's talk about that because you have Prince, who's basically James Brown and Jimi Hendrix have a kid who yeah. also becomes the best stage performer of his entire generation. And by the way, it's a generation with Michael Jackson in it. But I still think Prince is, you know, I think anybody who's ever seen Prince in person on stage when he actually gave a shit that night mm -hmm, would mm -hmm. probably put him first or in the top. Which was a lot of nights. Top two or three. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. There's no, there's no question. I saw Prince nine months before he died at some, mm. at some bar in New York city. He came in three hours late. Before that, there was a DJ who played for three hours and I danced. If I never dance again, I will dance. Mm. I will have danced all my dancing <laughs> waiting for Prince to show up because that woman killed us all. And then he shows up. And I remember this is this is a moment in time. The cast of Hamilton and the cast of the color purple. It's like he was waiting for their shows to break or something. And they come into this bar. 
And they're waiting. For, they, he makes them wait. So Jennifer Hudson is standing there when she was still with David Otunga. Yeah. And, you know, Leslie Odom, I believe Leslie Odom was there. Like a lot of the Camel, Hamilton cast is there. And we're all just waiting for Prince, who comes, plays for 20 minutes, <laughs> disappears, goes to eat. There's a, there's a rumor that he's going to come back after he has his dinner. By the way, it's one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Comes back and plays for like another 20 minutes. It it just was, this is what people will do for this man is not sleep because he might play 40 minutes of like semi-committed music. Yeah, that happened at NBA All-Star Weekend, I think in 2014. I was mm, there with mm-hmm. Rembert and Julian and a couple others and it was like, Prince is playing at this party. It's like, no way. It's like, no, he's, he's doing it. And everybody's just kind of, and then all of a sudden he came out and just did Prince stuff. And it ended with him just dropping his guitar and walking off. And we're like, is he coming back? It's like, no, not um, coming back. I just want to say really quick, I just want people listening to us talk to understand something about you, Bill, which is, I was looking for like, I feel like we've been poised to have this conversation for a long time. The purple I actually rain? thought, yes, I thought we had had it. And so I looked through my phone and like, did we do it? I don't remember, but I'm not sure. You have been talking about doing this for three years. I would, I, every once in a while, I would watch either a scene or the entire movie, and I would just text you, and I would be like, Yeah. Cause I, I think, well, we'll talk about some of the rewatchable scenes, but he has a couple scenes in there that are just yeah. like nothing that's ever been captured on film. We should also mention when we started working together at Grantland and we formed a podcast network that eventually became, uh, we had nine of the, 10 biggest podcasts at ESPN. You formed a podcast called Do You Like Prince Movies? With Alex Papadimus. Not one of the I nine. I think it might have been one of the nine. There weren't a lot of pods back then. But yeah, that Alex was, and I had called our that show. That was the Do title like of your movies? podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I because mean, you like more than Purple Rain. There were other Prince movies that you defended. I think Graffiti Bridge is, is a totally good, weird movie. And Under the Cherry Moon, another, it, that is just bad. But it's bad in, I mean, we'll get to like Apex Mountain and all that stuff and all the things you can do with the power that you have. And it clearly on Under the Cherry Moon went to his head. Yeah. But well, that's, a, I, that's your classic, I flew too close to the sun, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> creative mm-hmm. endeavor. Yeah, and nobody's yeah. telling him no at that point, right? Nobody's, nobody's telling He's him He's like, no. I'm going to zag. I know everybody loved Purple Rain, but I just was on concert for a year and a half playing basically this really elaborate, crazy show that was the movie every night over and over and over again. And now I need a zag. And that became Under the Cherry Moon. And I think Sign of the Times is also good. I really like that movie. Well, that's like a really, I mean, that's, if you're talking best concert films, that has to be yeah, at least yeah. mentioned. Uh, yeah. This album sold 15 million US copies, 25 million worldwide. Mm. 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 They released When Doves Cry in May. It hit number one. The album was released before the movie. That became number one. There was real buzz before the movie came out, and Prince isn't doing anything. Like, there's no like, oh, Prince went on Letterman. He's like, I'm out. I will do no promotion at all. But the album is a phenomenon. And right at a point when Thriller was kind of starting to die down, because Thriller they got 18 months out of, you know, that's Mm -hmm. just, they're just pulling like the seventh best song from Thriller and releasing it. It's top five. Prince, this album stayed number one for 24 weeks. When Doves Cry and Let's Go Crazy were number one. Uh, and then the album comes out and it crushes. I mean, the movie comes out and it crushes. And it all leads to, he wins an Academy Award for Best Original Rock Score, which, mm-hmm. by the way, they eliminated the category the next year. They were like, fuck this. Uh, he, wins, <laughs> he wins two Grammys. There's two spinoff albums from The Time and Apollonia 6. I can't believe they were able to get 10 Apollonia 6 songs. Listen, and, uh, listen. I don't know if you listen to it, but it's it's what you're saying is barely even true. So Well, the funniest it. thing about all these offshoot albums that weren't Prince albums, but all the songs sounded like rejected Prince songs. Mm, yeah. Like even yeah. in this even in this movie, the I want to be a modern air. Like yeah. that easily just could have um, been a rejected Purple Rain song. And oh, he just Dez. gave it to Des. What, um, what a hero. So then the years pass 
and this album still lives in the stratosphere. Like Rolling Stone did their 500 greatest albums ever, and Purple Rain was eighth. And then Apple, you, Apple did theirs, and it was number five. Yeah, and so then you actually look at the name. album, and it's like, yeah, that was a great album. But then you see it all laid out, like on Wikipedia or Spotify, wherever, and it's like, holy shit, that that album had, had the highest batting average of any uh, any album in the last forty years. There's just hits everywhere, and then even the cameos from the other stuff. Uh, it had a really weird effect on Prince, though, which everybody who loves Prince, he was just never the same after this came out. It fucked him mm -hmm. up. Later, mm -hmm. he called it mm -hmm. My Albatross. It'll be hanging around my neck as long as I'm making music. Another time, he said, in some ways, more detrimental than good. It pigeonholed me. And if you read the stuff, like there's a really good oral history they did about Purple Rain with a bunch of the people. Um, he just was so famous. Part of what made him Prince was he was really collaborative with all these different people. And within a couple of years, he's riding in his own bus. He's staying in these giant hotel suites where they're moving the pian the special piano in from city to city. <laughs> and he was just levitating too high above to actually collaborate that way. And and you you some of the quotes from like people like Wendy and Lisa, they were just kind of bummed out about it. Not not even really mad at him. It was just like this is just the outcome of what happened. He became too famous. I think it's deeper than that, right? It like. There's so much, this movie is such a rich text for all of Prince's, both his genius and his problems, right? His inability, the, the understanding that he has about what his musical intelligence and like innate talent can do, the effect it has on people. And there's a sense that I think he thinks that he could have done it without those people. He could have done Purple Rain without the revolution, right? Right. Um, and the beautiful thing about this movie that I always forget is that Purple Rain starts as... Purple Purple Rain is the reconciliation track, right? Yeah. It's the thing that Wendy and Lisa are writing that they want Prince to pay attention to. Yeah. And that's the song that sounds the most like it came entirely from Prince, but is in turn, like in the movie, the only collaboration but among the, at least the three of them, where you know, the, the audience knows they wrote it. He performs it and tells the audience before he does it that it's their song. Um, and, well, and, then just, it has, and then there's that great moment at the end when he's playing, they're playing it near the end and oh, he walks over to Wendy, Wendy. And, oh, the, yeah. and she's, she's kind of watching him make an eye contact with him, like trying to have a moment with him and he, and he sees it and then he leans over and kisses her and, and she almost starts crying. Yeah. And it's a, I, and I don't think that was like in the script or anything. I think they no, just had a moment. It is real. That is real. And the thing about, that relationship is they were so connected to each other as a band. And he didn't, he thought of like the James Brown thing is real, right? James Brown, yeah. notorious band leader, notoriously abusive band leader. Um, he Prince absorbed all of those lessons from James Brown, but also, you know, he grew up in a, in a tough house. Um, his dad used to be in a musician, used to be a musician, um, held his music, musical failures. Um, he blamed the, the two kids, two of his kids for not having a music career because yeah. he had to be a dad. He had to raise a family. Um, and there's, so there's so many lessons being practiced here. Um, and you think of, I mean, it's clearly, it's a work of fiction, but it's not a work of fiction in the way that a movie typically is. It's yeah, because Prince, Prince always says how, like, I, this is a movie. I was playing a part. And it's like, okay, there, come on. There's some pieces it, of you in that part. Just admit yeah, it. Yeah, but, but, but I was going to say, like, it's mythology, right? Like, he is, I mean, first of all, I mean, he's not called Prince in the movie. He's called the kid, right? Yeah. We never, we don't know what this kid's name is. He's just the kid. So that's a myth, and there's a mythology, or there's a fairy tale, or a fable in and of itself that happened. We know is we know is the last, the initial of his last name is L. That's the only information we have. He's the kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an L. Um, his name's like Bob Lawton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, that would be that'd be deep. Um, um, Francis Gum is his is his birth name. Nineteen ninety nine blows up the album. Yes, that's Prince from eighty two, right? Yeah, Prince tells his manager Robert Cavallo, "I want to star in a big studio movie, and if you don't find me when I'm firing you, mm-hmm. he's like fine." Mm-hmm. Couldn't figure it out. Um, talks to a famed screenwriter, the movie fame, William Blinn. Prince has hammered out the plot points of the movie. So he said, there's some notepad that has Prince's thoughts of how Purple Rain mm-hmm. should go. Mm-hmm. Give it to this William Blinn guy. He takes a stab at it. Then Albert Magnoli, who was just a music editor or music video editor at that point, mm-hmm. he joins his mm-hmm. director, rewrites it. And somehow it's coherent enough on top of the fact that Prince tells him, hey, I have 100 produced songs, so let me know which ones you need. He was like, 100? That nobody's heard? He's like, yeah, we'll just dip into a lot of those. And the rest is history. $7.2 million budget made $70 million. It's the Mm. 11th biggest movie in 1984. In 1984, how many movies in the top 40 do you think had non-white stars? 84. Um, Top 40 movies. Top 40. Um... Isn't isn't forty eight hours eighty four? Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop. There's an Eddie Murphy, okay. Purple Rain, uh, and there's one other. There's three total. Eighty four. I'll DC, tell you the answer. DC Cab. Breaking. Breaking. Okay. All right. I that was. That's it. Yeah, That's all we that had. That sounds right. That sounds right. That sounds right. Our guy Raj loved this movie. Him and Cisco both had it. Top ten, nineteen eighty four. Hmm. Raj eventually called it one of the great rock movies of all time. Mm -hmm. He gave it three and a half stars when it came out. He said, Purple Rain has an interesting solution to the problem of trying to combine a dramatic story with a lot of musical footage, uh, long passages, brief, sharp, highly emotional, dramatic scenes, dramas condensed into intense emotional exchanges. The result is one of the best combinations I've seen of music and drama. (laughs) Prince and Apollonia come across with really exciting romantic chemistry. I mm. like the movie. That's from Raj. <laughs> uh, and then Prince said a few days before the premiere, he had a nightmare that Siskel and Ebert hated the film and Ebert ripped it apart. And he said, I dreamed those two guys on the TV were reviewing the movie and that fat guy was tearing me up. The opposite happened. So there you go. Prince intersecting with Siskel and Ebert. We're going to do most rewatchable scene. It's brought to you by Nissan. Find your path in the Nissan Pathfinder Rock Creek. This is really hard, Wesley. The first 11 minutes of this movie, holy fucking hell. Oh my God. Holy hell. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we start, We just start with, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. And it's like, what's going on? And then all of a sudden we go into let's go crazy, but we're also following Apollonia, jumping out of a cab. We get to see Prince get ready. We get to see Morris get ready. This is we the get- opening of Cabaret. Cabaret opens exactly the same way. Oh, interesting. It's the, it's, you know, you're at the Kit Kat Club and Joel Gray's doing his, you know, welcome in, bienvenue, welcome. And Michael York is arriving in Berlin at that very moment. And you, I don't, you're not seeing Liza Minnelli quite yet. She doesn't come for like 12 minutes into the movie. And she's got that great number where she's got a purple, purple sash in her hat. This yeah. movie is definitely a wear cabaret. Like purple is 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 part of Sally Bowles's signature color situation. Uh, Prince yeah. has a great guitar solo. <laughs> yeah, Apollonia debuts a bunch of different great looks that I got to give her credit for of just her watching Prince play. And sometimes her face is like, I can't wait to jump that guy's bones. Mm-hmm. Other mm-hmm. times it's like, this guy's reaching a part of my soul I didn't know existed. Then it's I the, don't think she she really didn't know she had a soul. I mean, well, this is that kind of, this is that kind of acting. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. And then there's the this the guy's hurting my feelings. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, just some great faces for Burn. And then we get the waitress Jill that she bumps into. And uh, Jill just, Jones. Jill Jones. Who I really liked. Um, oh, I love Jill Jones. Jill Jones is one of the Prince's protégés, right? Like, that's yeah. a sad story. That we don't have to get into that. But, like, basically, you know, she's made up to look like a Jane Mansfield, you know, I guess Nancy Nancy Allen, I guess, is the closest thing to 1984 that she looks right. like. Right. Little Melanie Griffith-ish. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. 
So let's go crazy. And it's like, man, I need a cigarette. That was great. Nope. We're bringing out more. Stay in the time. It's time, it's time for Jungle Love. Let's go. 90 seconds oh, we later. Oh, we oh. Yeah. Um, I think I was thinking in person, this would have been like one of the top three greatest moments of my life if you were just there that day when they were like, we're going to film these back to back. Let's go. Mm. Like, can you imagine being there for that? I Let's mean, go no. crazy right into Jungle Love. No, I mean, I think the triumph of the movie, I mean, this seems, might be obvious, we don't need to say it, but I mean, this is just one of the best cases, one of the greatest cases ever made for, for, for a, a I'm putting in quote live performance, right? Like, cause yeah. it's not, it's not live, live. Um, but there's just something electric about Morris and Jerome on stage the way that those, because this is the MTV era, we have to be, we have to keep, I don't know if we need to keep hammering this, but the way that these sequences work are just completely different from how they worked in a musical. And right. even two years earlier, they're different. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Fosse, the, like, I bring up Fosse again just to say that the part of what he was a pioneer at is the sort of the, I guess the psychological explication of a musical experience where there can be choreography on stage, but also in the house, right? And so the great thing about that opening 12 minute sequence is not just what's happening on stage. It's the, the stylization of the audience, right? Everybody in the crowd has a look. Yeah. Um, and they're they're framed, that look is being framed numerous times and then intercut with what's going on with Prince and the revolution on stage. Yeah, the club um, just seems amazing. Yeah, you know, the club is a character and that they shut down the club for 25 days and gave them a hundred grand. They're just like, we're filming here. Yeah. And uh yeah. every piece of it, even like the little balcony. Where they they got, there's like just like the five dancers just on call ready to do that shit. That is my favorite moment. I mean, I've got a lot of favorite moments in this movie, but but that moment during Jungle Love, yeah, where one guy starts doing the you know starts dancing, yeah, and then the guy to his and they do the arm left, thing, yes, yeah. and then there's three guys just all synchronized doing the same move so far away from, from the stage and so far away from the audience. It's just for the camera. It's just for us. So I, we don't get to give out this award a lot, but it's, it's one of my favorite rewatchables awards. And I'm just going to give it right now before we move to the rest of the rewatchable scenes, the Tom Sizemore for me, the action is the juice award for best toe to toe <laughs> moment for a non-star with a major star. The time just being like, Oh, thanks for playing. Let's go crazy. We're going to follow that with jungle love <laughs> is absolutely the action is the juice. <laughs> Cause they're like 97% as good and as fun to watch. And I have a lot of thoughts on them for later. Well, All right. So that world bill in which like I take my grandmother or my grandmother takes me to this movie. Cause I would have been too little to go by myself. Like my grandmother takes me and she's like, Morris Day, right? I need his phone number right now. Like there's just a world in which people who don't know what's going on are like, sign me up for the time. I'm taking all the stock right now. Yeah. Just give it all I, to you. I got to say, I lost a lot of stock on the time. I mean, but I was a teenager. Did I didn't have a lot it? of money on it, but you know, <laughs> I just, I did put some stuff down on the time. Didn't go great. All right. Next one. Uh, take me with you. Mm. The bike ride. We get a bike ride. We get Prince unveiling the first of 28. What would you call the smile? The, simper. That, it's I don't want to show my teeth, but I'm, I am want to show some sign. It's a simper? He's the Prince simpering. simper? He's simpering. He's Which like a then, little... Uh, you know, it, we made... We we teased because we love Prince. We used that was when you teased this movie, you would make that face. And then Chappelle was like, 20 years later, Chappelle's like, hold my beer. I'm gonna do well, the best version of Prince ever. The the thing about that look, right, is I mean, he is dressed, we should say, he spends the in so we don't see this dude in a t-shirt and jeans. Yeah, he's One dressed like Siegfried time. and Roy for the entire movie. <laughs> he's dressed like he's about to tame a lion. 
he's he looks like the he looks like the prince in a renaissance painting right yeah like he's dressed for oil paint in in the 15th century or the, in the in the well thank god he's century. dressed for a motorcycle ride and fortunately for us apollonia was also dressed for the motorcycle <laughs> ride and then he Until takes she's her to, undressed right <laughs> he, right he takes her to this actually isn't lake minnetonka and they have some bad dialogue and you what do you dream about and it, it's I think the bad dialogue exchanges are actually one of the reasons I love this movie. But then uh, he tells her she has to purify herself in the waters of Lake Minnetonka. And, you know, Phoebe Cates, Fast Times is still number one. But Apollonia, for the teenage boys of the 80s, this was, this was one of the scenes. I just want to be clear about this moment. Because I'd always, remember it, I'd always remembered it as his telling her she has to do it. He doesn't tell her... I remember the punchline, which is that it's not like Manitaka, but 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 I remember it as being like he didn't say purify. He's like you got to take your clothes off and get in there and baptize yourself. Yeah. Like all he says is you got to purify. Like part of this initiation for love with me is you got to purify self purify yourself in the in the waters of Lake Manitaka, which she receives as I have to take my clothes off and get in this water right now because that's what I'm being asked to do. So I think this woman has had some experiences that she needs to deal with. <laughs> and being in a relationship with this man is not helping. Right. Because even she goes in, in real life, she almost gets hypothermia, um, comes mm -hmm. out. That's all mm -hmm. legit because the water's freezing. But then he does the thing where he pretends to drive away and he's got the oh my smile. God. And then she has the reverse Apollonia smile. Like, I'm enjoying the flirting here. Like... I know he's not actually going to drive away, and I'll, I'll, I'm happy to play this cat and mouse game with him. But uh, the that whole scene, memorable to say the least. That leads to our next one, and there's a lot of great moments in there. But I'm, I'm just trying to play the hits. Um, we have a Morris Apollonia date mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that the kid notices, <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, you know what? You know what's going to be perfect here? Beautiful ones." So we get the the dialogue of your lips would make a lollipop happy. And Morris is just hitting on her and doing stuff. And then Prince comes out. I mean, I think this is his greatest performance in the movie. Mm. And I think it's I, one of the great performances ever. It's unbelievable. Nobody was doing shit like this in 1984. That is really insightful, Bill. I mean, I, I, I say it's insightful because, I mean, I know... I know that the band thinks that this movie is a documentary, basically. Um, and that Prince essentially, he was really going through something. And I don't, he, he's so invested in that moment. Like, like the, there's, there are parts where he's, he's not acting anywhere in this movie, honestly, except maybe the scenes with the, with the parents. Um, but that moment is so clearly intense and angry. Um, and well, the, the, how about the part when he's really kept, like, there's some point where he's like Steph Curry just hitting threes from 35 feet, where he's <laughs> he's prancing around. He does like the, the oh, pulls the yeah. jacket at one point, mm -hmm. and he's mm -hmm. just like he's just pulling the energy of everyone in the crowd. I can't imagine what it would have been like to be there. And then that kid, they do that great slow zoom on her because mm -hmm. he's he's basically like, hey, are we doing this or not? And Morris is in the zoom for the first part. And Morris is like, Jesus Christ, this guy's like, how am I going to bounce <laughs> back from this? Can I get some more champagne? And it just goes in and she's just like, this guy is singing this song to me and I'm losing my mind right now. Yeah. So camera comes in and that's like, that's it. She's She's got him. But I, I think... He's just so on fire in that scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know, there, there's been other moments with him. Like he's had a couple like famous award show moments when he would just pop in. He was great. The AMAs in 1985. Um, he had oh, that I one Rock and Roll speech. Hall of Fame one. There's good video of him, but it's hard to imagine a better five minutes from him than that performance. The other thing is, I, I think it's like a borderline lip sync because they, they made all of these songs in concert. And he's then they sang over the tracks, right? So they're singing, right. but they're also performing at the same time. And you wouldn't know. You would think he's doing it live. You wouldn't know. I mean, the commitment from everybody is so hard 
just the choreography, just the choreography of the band, right? Yeah. There's a moment in Let's Go Crazy that is, I mean, there, there are a lot of erotic moments in this movie that have nothing to do with sex per se, although this movie is extremely sexual. Um, and I find that moment during Let's Go Crazy, there's the moment where he kind of masturbates the guitar. And then there's a, which there's, moment? There's like five. Sorry, there's, there's five guitar masturbation. There's the there's the first ejaculatory. <laughs> the, guitar the guitar shoots moment. a cum shot right. at the end of the movie. Right. Yes, that's also we didn't get. So yeah, talk about premature. Okay, so <laughs> but there's a moment where he and Wendy are so locked in with each other, and their moves are so synced, and she is so hot to me. I totally agree. I thought She's Wendy was so an sexy. icon. Also, oh. good actress. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's kind yeah. of a bad to mediocre actor in this, and she's actually like, I, I had that written down. I, I just think she's electric in this movie. Anyway, that's a great one. The next one would be the When Doves Cry montage leading into Prince and His Dad, which is basically like a top line, top latch 1984 music video. Yes. And- it's funny that in the research, Magnoli says to Prince, they're in post-production. They haven't filmed this part. They, they filmed a lot of stuff, but they don't have it. And uh, he's like, I need like a song for a montage. Do you have anything? And the next day, Prince is like, here's When Doves Cry. Mm, and that mm-hmm, was, then mm-hmm. they crafted along there. And uh, and it, it kind of does some heavy lifting because we get one more dad scene and then we go right into, Wendy, yes, Lisa. And we go into computer blue. Um, but the Wind Doves Cry music video, that's not a music video. It's a scene is really good. Wait, where do you stand on Clarence Williams in this movie? I mean, you know, that man has had a lot of bites of the apple. And this was, this. he gets better as the movie goes. It's not a huge part. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing about this film is that it is doing the same thing that the all black musicals of the forties did, you know, the Vincent Minnelli, you know, cabin in the sky and stormy weather, um, which is, you know, light skin, black people, great dark skin, black people, not so great. The only major dark skin character after Jerome is the dad. Yeah. Um, who beats up his white wife, and smacks around his in the movie biracial son. Prince is not biracial. This is a whole fantasy that he had about, you know, being neither nor both and. Um, but I don't know. I mean, Clarence Thomas, uh, Clarence Thomas, Clarence Williams, <laughs> Clarence Williams the third. He's he's fine. He's he's doing this job. He looks rough. Um, and do you know, anybody, do you know Link was my first favorite TV character ever? I was just about to say, like anybody the mod who, squad? who was watching this movie, probably even kids might have known that that this guy was Link on the Mod Squad. Yeah, my dad found these like preschool stuff where I would write my name down as Link, which I don't remember. Stop it! I was like, I swear to God, really? It was like three or four. I love Link. <laughs> I love the Mod Squad. That was my first favorite show. I mean, Peggy um, Lipton. Next one, darling Nikki. Hmm. Hmm. Insane isn't a strong enough word for this scene. No. I can't imagine being there when he played this. The song um, itself is is pretty great. And also the lyrics by 1984 standards were like, she's doing what? She's masturbating in the magazine? What? What's going on? Um, the performance itself, how he's trying to mind fuck Apollonia is just like, and this is the scene where you're like, is this guy kind of evil? What's going on with him? This then, is the scene for you? Well, he- this is this is when it hammers home. <laughs> and then uh, and then we get Billy Sparks' big scene as the club manager coming off this. This stage is no place for your personal business. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody thinks I, your business but yourself. I love that Billy is really close reading the songs. Billy is more engaged than anybody except for Prince and the Revolution in this music. Right? right. Like he he knows. I mean, this is going to go in the in the in the nitpicking realm later, but has Billy heard this music before? Like like right. I have a lot a lot of questions, but we'll get to that later. Well, Billy's but, basically a Tipper Gore proxy cuz he doesn't right. want the club to be that raunchy. So the scene before or that like the song before Computer Blue that's when Wendy kind of goes to her knees 
and oh. she's like fake blowing standing fake blowing the Prince kid he yeah as guitar. he's like yeah. having like his guitar orgasm and billy's like what the hell is it and then we go to darling nikki so <laughs> it's not the kind of club billy wants to run he wants first avenue to be a family business um i just want to tip the scale a little bit while we're like laying out these most rewatchable scenes and just say that this this sequence is extraordinary because it the, the movie itself is extraordinary for what it for how faithful to the album it is right right um but the the sequel that going from computer blue to darling nikki is as it happens on the album and there is something about the transition here, the the movie's faithfulness in the um, all of the action being ba- balanced at the same time. Yeah, um, it it's just it's a great musical. It's a great moment for the band, um, and it's just like him with no shirt, totally sweaty. The well, then computer blue, he's got he's eye. got that mask thing on, yes. like he said, eyes yes. wide shut. Yes, the lingerie over the eyes is, re- but he can see, right? Yeah, that's the thing. He's just wearing un- like like lingerie on his face, right? Like like a superhero, which I want to come back to. By the way, um, oh, the superhero thing. All right, yeah. we got to keep moving. Um, Let's go. I mean, there's really two more scenes. I it this is a short one, but. Prince figuring out Purple Rain on the piano, I just love. It's short, mm-hmm. but uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but we go right into from that. Like he's finally like his dad is in the hospital. He finds the papers, so his dad lied to him. His dad actually did write music down. Starts playing the Purple Rain on the piano, and then it goes right into time performing. The time performing again, mm-hmm. um, and then mocking him after. Let's That's- go crazy. <laughs> I want to say just about the the writing down of the music, how how deep and historical and black that is, um, and this this idea that a real musician among a certain class of black musician doesn't need to write it down because it comes from your soul, and to record it is basically to take a snapshot of it and to lock it in time and lock it in place. But there's something about the dad's awareness of how illegitimate. Of a, of a certain kind of musician it would be to write this stuff down. But also, on the other hand, as a matter of melodrama and sentimentality, it, Prince needs something to discover and remember his father's glory days by. Yeah. Um, but it also proves that his father is probably, we don't know, an intuitive musician, but also like a classical musician, right? A jazz musician and a classicist. So there's that. Yeah, I had that in unanswered roles. I guess we do it now. Francis L., what, what was his career looking like? Probably late 60s, early 70s. Probably a, a jazz pianist. Possibly. Um, maybe I mean, a couple Computer bands. Blue, Computer Blue in this movie is his riff, right? Yeah. Um, that's that's something he come up with. I don't know what format it would go in, but I mean, if he's writing this stuff down, he's probably a jazz musician. How's the family for Morris is one of the worst digs. It just cuts so deep when he so says that. It's like, oh my God, what? that's like the meanest thing anyone's ever said. Ooh. Morris, I want to like you. Why do you have to do that? I'm coming around to Questlove the more that we get into this. It actually yeah. is. It is. This is a hip hop beef. Uh, last one. The last. It's the last like 16 minutes of the movie. Ladies and gentlemen, the revolution. He does the Francis L. dedication. Mm-hmm. This is a song from from Wendy and Lisa. Wendy does the look like, holy shit, we're playing it. Um, This song has to be great for how this movie has built up toward it. And it's great. Yeah. Well, it actually the- matches the moment in all of these different ways. It's the title of the movie. It has to be an A plus and it's an A plus. But interestingly... Let me make sure I'm I'm 100% sure about this. But I'm actually curious about, like, do you think the movie should have ended there? No. No. Um, You could make the case, but... Oh, now you're in my head. It it absolutely could have ended there, but then we don't get I Would Die For You and Baby I'm a Star, and we don't get, like, Prince just... We don't get him running backstage. 
We don't get him sitting there hearing the applause. We don't get the incredible Jill cameo with the, hey, and she's just tears come down her face. Then he sees everybody. Then he comes back on and he's like, that's it. He's finally connected with the audience in the right way. So I think we need it. Right. Because I just think that, that, you know, this isn't, this is the one out of sequence portion of the movie, right? Um, well, that's not true. When Dove, uh, it goes in and out of sequence, basically. Yeah. But but the album, of course, ends with Purple Rain. That's the last song on the album. Oh, you're saying like from a, yeah, I got you. From a song sequence, it's out of sequence. Right. But I'm wondering, I mean, that moment is so effective. But I I, I always forget that there are two more numbers left. And they're part of this of this sequence, this last performance, basically. Well, if we don't get the last song, we don't get the guitar cum shot. Really, the movie's not building up to Purple Rain. It's building up to a guitar ejaculation. But the arg, but the movie and the album are arguing two different things, also, right? The movie is making a case for Prince as as the biggest star in the world, right? Like he is he is claiming. You know, he's there are these odes to thriller, these like callbacks to thriller, Michael Jackson's thriller video, where he, you know, takes Ola Ray out and then turns into a werewolf. He tries to scare Apollonia at some point in his lair. Um right. I, I I think that the movies, the movie's point is that I am a bigger star than Michael Jackson. I'm a better star than Michael Jackson. I can do things on this stage with my instrument metaphorically and literally that Michael Jackson isn't even trying to do and couldn't do even if he did try. Um, and, and I'm, and I'm sexier and more realistic companion to the ladies than Michael Jackson is the other piece of this. I was hotter as a kid for Michael Jackson than I was for Prince. Nobody was um, like, Oh my God, Michael's Michael's laying some pipe this week. <laughs> <laughs> Look out, ladies! Michael uh, Michael Jackson's feeling horny tonight. Well, what's you know what's funny though, Bill? Along those lines, there's that moment where he takes before you get um before we get. I think we are not at when doves cry yet. Was this right before when doves cry? He takes Apollonia to his to his basement. Yeah, to his, his weird basement. His, He's his living basement. in mom's basement. I mean, it's it's deeper than that. He's it's writing like a twins blog. Nightmare on Elm Street territory down there. Yeah, it is I mean, pretty even creepy. even the music is going dark. Um, it knows that it's kind of in horror movie land, and it it understands that there's a danger in that in that in that nether region of his life. Um, but there's a moment where she touches him, and he says she touches him, and she says, "King Kong," and he goes, "Stop." And then he touches her and she says, no, there's just some weird, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's not S and M, right. But it's like kids trying to figure out how to initiate sex. Cause right. after that, they're off to the races. It's like, they can't stop doing it. Oh yeah. We got a little, yeah. Um, like what do King, you got for Kong, most? King Kong is deep. What do you got for most rewatchable scene? You have to oh, pick the one. End. The end, the end. The end, the end. It is so exciting and also unnecessary. I'm actually, I find, I, I'm perfectly comfortable arguing that, that this movie should have ended at Purple Rain. It should have ended, you can get the same slow motion shot. You can find a way to send this band off in a blaze of glory. At that yeah. point, Apollonia is an afterthought anyway. Right. Um. There's no romantic tension to settle because all of the tension, romance wise, is between him and the music and him and the band, right? That's the resolution that needs to happen here, not things with her. So I think it's I think it's those last three songs. They're I vote for, 20 minutes. I vote for beautiful ones and the Apollonia Morris date happening into beautiful ones is my favorite okay. part of the movie. And one of my okay. favorite sections of any 80s movie. All right, new category. What's the most 1984 thing about this movie that's not Prince? <laughs> The boom boxes uh, playing playing cassettes in a boom box. I'll give you that as a choice. I'll give you the haircuts. Mm -hmm. I'll give you Morris mm -hmm. having a brass waterbed. I'll giving wow. should I or should I not engage in domestic violence as a plot device for the 11th biggest movie of 1984. 
And I'll give you, in real life, the female lead of this movie, Apollonia, was dating David Lee Roth. Doesn't it, doesn't it figure? <laughs> what do you have for the most 1984 thing about this movie? Um, I mean, I like yours. I think the boom boxes are important. I also think that the, the most 1984 thing about this movie is its, is its, is, is its form, right? It's the way it's been edited. There are, there are cuts. Good call. Uh, like in those concert sequences that go from audience to stage to somewhere in the club. And then that obligatory, I don't even know what we call this shot. I bet you Sean Fennessy knows like the it's or Chris Ryan, actually like there's, there's that it's like an action shot, but there's nothing in it, but like were, it's just like yeah. a worrying shot of a camera of something being panned to the left or to the right. And it's just there to connote, to literalize action. But there's no action in it. It's just a camera panning across who knows what. And it just looks like it's connecting two disparate fields of energy with just the swoop of, of, of camera stuff. That shot happens a handful of times in this movie. And it is such a it is such an 80s way of literalizing the figurative and of like creating an energy. Uh, that does not, we don't use, that doesn't get used at all anymore. The single uh, frame montage in, in Let's Go Crazy is very 1984 too, when it's just yes, like all this yes. collage of people. All right, yes. what's age the best? God damn, I love Wendy and Lisa. Ooh. First of all, Wendy's Meryl Streep in this movie. Even Meryl <laughs> Streep's like, that lady can act. Um, I'm not I going love, that far, but I hear you. I love when they mock him when he's like, what are you guys doing here? And they play the synth and she's like, I'm here to tell you there's something else. Our music. Yes. And they're just like yes. so catty with him. Um, there's some really crazy real life shit that's in there that actually just mirrors what happened. They end up, he fires them at the end of 1986. Mm -hmm. Also, mm -hmm. I don't think I knew this forever, but I just thought they were friends, but they were like one of the first great lesbian celebrity couples, but they- Oh, Wendy and Lisa they were, were in a relationship. Su super, you know, confidential about it. But I didn't know that in the 80s, but they were together for like 20 years and they, it was became a pretty well-known thing. It mm -hmm, wasn't something, mm -hmm. there was no way to know that in 1984, but- I didn't um, know. Such a style. Lisa, at one point, they have that one scene and she's just got like- Two thirds of her boob is just hanging out. Like they're just so comfortable with, with their how they look and how they're just hanging and how they're like battling prints. It's there. I just love them. Yeah, I think I every time I watch this, I re I remember how much they were my favorite part of the Prince experience. They have a solo album. Um, they, they have did, a couple. They did a bunch solo. of albums. I, I mean, but I'm with, saying the way solo, Wendy you mentioned well, this earlier. But, the way Wendy Wendy clicked with Prince. It was, there was like a little Jordan Pippen with it, with the way they moved together on mm -hmm. stage. Mm -hmm. I, it was just really special. It's, I mean, I, I was Prince just, wasn't, I guess, meant to be with a band long term with anybody, but it's, it's, but too he bad. kept forming them and breaking up. Like he yeah. kept trying to recreate these family scenarios and then become, he becomes disappointed anytime he realizes that a family is a collective unit and not like a dictatorship that the daddy runs, right? Right. Basically. He's just um, too famous to be in a family. Yeah, um, I just I just want to say that the, the the first Wendy and Lisa album is fantastic. That's it. It's called Wendy and Lisa. That's it. I just love it. It's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite low level like B plus albums. Hmm. More would say the best Prince's live performances in this seems like he's actually singing, but as far as I could tell, they they weren't recording any of this stuff live. They were just no. singing over it. Uh I really like the modern heirs who somehow didn't end up on the Purple Rain album. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Des Dickerson, man, he he was he's just a wonderful like person to like there's so much untapped. I don't think he knows what happened. Right. No. I think he's he was in the he was in the revolution, then he was out and around. I don't I don't really know what the I want to be a modern air, modern air, modern air. <laughs> I don't really know what's going on in that song, but that was very 1984. Um, he made up a word and it yeah, he, it's it's too bad that or a concept even, right? Like it's just too bad it didn't catch on because what is a modern air? I mean, I think it's I think, you know, to be this person, I think it's a flaneur. It's like a person who in one sense is it's Prince, right? It's yeah. Prince. Prince would be a modern air. 
Like so a modern era is like, I want to have a lot of oil in my hair and, a, and very heavy jackets, and I want to be fucking cool as hell? Yeah, basically, okay. essentially. Uh, Morris and Jerome's mirror gimmick, I don't know if it's the number one gimmick of all time for me, but it's in the conversation. Mm. I don't know why I love it so much. 40 years later, I still love it. I don't know what makes it work the way it does. I can understand Jerome eventually um, felt like he didn't have enough to do in the band and and left. And more, we know Morris had a bunch of problems, but it's just so funny to watch those two together on stage. It's such a can't. I mean, the thing that the, that works with the mirror is it's kind of timeless, right? Yeah. I mean, for all that, I mean, every person in this movie has a Renaissance era corollary, right? And there's something. I mean, basically Morris, I mean, basically Jerome is a lady in waiting, right? Like he is, he is the person holding mirrors for queens and princesses. Um, And there's such a fascinating collapse of of masculinity and femininity in this movie that feels also very black to me. Um, You know, in order to get your hair to look like that, you got to, you got to wrap it up every day. And the first time we see Morris, his hair you know, he's got his hair wrapped, essentially. Yeah. Um, it's just, this movie is is simultaneously revealing and concealing at the same time. And that mirror gimmick is, is, is like the epitome of that revelation and concealment. Um, yeah. Because at the same time that Morris is looking, Jerome can't see anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's holding the mirror like sideways. Um, um Morewood Sage the best. Should have mentioned this earlier, but I mean, especially by cable uh purposes in the 80s, like just this was a movie you could jump in at any time. Any time. Like, oh, oh, we're about to have beautiful ones. Great. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, oh, mm-hmm. the darling Nikki scene's coming up. Awesome. Oh, it's yeah. the start of the movie. Oh, it's the last 20 minutes. Like it really didn't matter. Um Prince's scene with Jill the waitress mm. when he comes in and she's like, Wendy and Lisa left something for you. And he's like, what is it? A subpoena? <laughs> like the acting in that is like, it's just mid eighties porn level acting. I love it. Um, mentioned the fake blowjob with Wendy during computer blue. The uh, Prince is wearing Seinfeld's puffy shirt for the last mm. 15 minutes of the movie and other parts. And I don't know if did Seinfeld get the puffy shirt from this. Didn't movie? we all think that that puffy shirt was Prince basically? I mean, they got, they called like it they like they were a mocking Prince. Shirt. Yeah. The pirate. I, shirt. I don't know, but I only ever received it as a Prince shirt. Like, I don't know what everybody else is talking about. That was Prince to me. I'm a sex shooter. <laughs> <laughs> my direction. <laughs> I, I like it. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> um, in movie music rivalries always work for me just in general. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, Dave Chappelle mm-hmm. is Prince. Um, that's been a what's age the best for the last 20 years. The uh 1980s Minnesota, mm, mm-hmm. which was not just like a Minnesota funk scene, but there's a whole bunch of other alternative bands. And I mean, it was like I had no idea. I was in the Northeast. I didn't know Minnesota was this yeah, burgeoning musical empire. Yeah. Jimmy Husker and Terry Duke. Prince. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Bob Mold. I mean, there was so much happening in Minnesota at that time. And it was, I mean, as a Philadelphian, when it would trickle over, when it made its way over as something from Minnesota, right? That's how I yeah. found Husker Du was like this band from, from Minneapolis. Um, or I don't know. I don't remember if it was from, I, I might've, so it was like the Minnesota, Minnesota era. Yeah. 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 Um, so can I just say one thing about sex shooter though? My favorite, one of my favorite things about this movie is this, is that somebody in the editing room was like, we got to make sure we keep the scene. We got it. We had to keep the whole song so that when the blonde lady, her, she's got a line, right? They, we need to see them. We need to see who's saying the line, come on, have some fun kiss and come and kiss the gun, right? Like we need to see the person saying that line. It's just such an authentic touch. And this movie is full of little things like that. And apparently Apollonia was an actress. She wasn't a singer. So they really had to like work with her on the performance. They dubbed her lyrics and she, she's done done a bunch of interviews about this movie since, but she was like, I was terrified. I never sang anything. They went, they went more for the look with her. Mm -hmm. Um, Welcome. That's the other thing about 1984. <laughs> right. So 
Magnolia said, he said, it's August 3rd, I guess 1983. I'm I'm in the mezzanine of First Avenue. One of the songs Prince played that night, as soon as the concert over, I ran downstairs. I said, what's that song? It sounds like a Bob Dylan anthem. He said, Mm. it's called Purple Rain. Mm. I said, that's the song I'm missing. Mm. He said, that's great. Can we call the movie that? And that's how fast the title came into being. I love, you know, we've done 353 rewatchables. Just how simple and stupid some of this stuff is. Like, Mm -hmm. hey, what's that Mm -hmm. song called? Purple Rain. Can we call the movie that? Yeah, sure. And then all of a sudden we have Purple Rain for 40 years. Uh, Any other what's age the best for you? I mean, I think the time. Right. I think the time as a band, I think they remain underrated. Let's fucking do this um, now. I had it later, but let's go right now. I mean, I just feel like you watch them in this movie and there is just a world in which, so I've got Pauline Kale's review. I just want to read you something about okay. what she says about Morris. She kind of liked the movie fine. I think she felt like she was too old to really get it. So she writes about how the kids are into it. Mm. Always a bad sign. Yeah. Tough stage person. of her career too at this but point. But she's still killing it. She's still yeah. killing it. This is from this is from State of the Art. Um, and here's what she says about Morris. And when he and his handsome sidekick, Jerome Benton, who looks like a dark Douglas Fairbanks senior, <laughs> dance to the Times music, they have a loose, floppy grace. Morris Day suggests a Richard Pryor without the genius and the complications. Part of the pleasure of watching him is that his musical numbers are shaped. So is his performance. He uses distance and tension. This is certainly a contrast to Prince, who doesn't want us to react to a performance. He wants us to react to him, to his greatness. I disagree, but that's a, that's an, like, I see where she's going because she's yeah. right. I mean, he is he is so put together and the band is so put together in this movie and the songs just sound great and in a different way than than Purple Rain, than the than the songs of Purple Rain sound um performed in a club. The 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 time was a club band. They made club music and jungle love and um The Bird Song. The bird yeah. I, the I bird. never really knew what the title of that song was. I just knew I loved it. I can't believe I forgot it. This is what I, I love that song. But you know, the, the thing about the time is they never went anywhere after this movie. I mean, they never disappeared after well, this that, movie. They, I think they, there there might have been some substance stuff with right, but with the band. I mean, I don't, this was I don't the height they, of the Coke era. I don't mean they didn't go anywhere like success wise. They they became very successful. Like yeah. they came back in the nineties. They had um, they had fishnet. The they nostalgia had, re- the nostalgia renaissance was really good for them. Mm-hmm, they popped mm-hmm. up like they even were in Jay and, Bi- Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. They were the last four minutes of that movie. Like they were always kind of around. And they just were good at their jobs. They just I agree. Were, Morris is really, really charismatic. Not a great singer, um, but a great presence. And that always comes through in the music. His laugh. He's got one of the great laughs. Yeah. All right. Some uh, quickie categories. This is a new one suggested by Kyle Brandt last week. We're in Test Drive It. <laughs> <laughs> F- fortune from Rudy, the uh, Charles S. Dutton character. Yeah. The Fortune Three Clap Award for most gifable moment. <laughs> so the most gifable moment of this movie is pick twenty creepy, weird Prince smiles. That uh, you any of those like side shots of him where he's thinking and then his face turns into like a. I would vote for that unless you would come up. What uh, is there another gifable moment? The swoop uh, on Apollonia? I think that there is the look that she, there's an early, there's an early, I guess it's a, you're panning into Apollonia when she gets to that apartment for the first time and she looks around it and she, this is the best look she gives in the movie to me. It's not yeah. the Prince. It's at that dingy ass apartment they move her into. Yeah. And there's just, I'm like, I always get tricked into thinking this is going to be a great performance just by the look that she gives when she sees mm. how bad that apartment is. That can be used for all kinds of shit. Great shot, Gordo Award, most cinematic shot. Was that slow swoop in on Apollonia during the beautiful ones? I, re- I like how that looks. I would vote for yeah. that. Yeah. Then at these, Benny Hanna Award, First Avenue, The Nightclub. The Kid Cudi Pursuit of Happiness Award for Best Needle Drop. I think the whole movie wins. I'm not picking a moment. You can't. I guess no. maybe 
it's when doves cry, just kicking it out of nowhere at the montage, just because that's like an official needle drop, but you can't pick well, one. I think that I think uh Take Me With You is a great needle drop because it doesn't happen on stage, basically, right? Oh, right. And it's a transition. Yeah, maybe that's the answer. Okay. Um Big Kahuna Burger where best use of food and drink. Probably the <laughs> champagne order. Get my change back, will you? All right. What stage the worst? Some pretty bad acting in this movie. Um, mm-hmm. I enjoy it, but not great. Um, I mean, this is one of the legacies of this movie is uh, not a great movie for the treatment of women. Mm-hmm. And as, as the years have passed, uh, it has become part of the legacy of the movie. We got Jerome puts a girl in a dumpster. The kid's dad, every scene with him, he's an absolute awful disaster. The uh, revolution bandmates joke about Wendy's period. The star of the movie hits a woman. We almost hits her again. It's almost like yep. when, when we had Macho Man Randy Savage in the mid '80s, where part of the gimmick was uh, like, "Please Elizabeth. don't hit Miss Elizabeth, please no." Mm. And mm. we kind of get that for the last half hour, and it's just very strange to watch. I'll be interested in producer Craig's thoughts on that later. But on the other hand, Prince Prince defended it over the years after, like, "Hey, it's a movie. We're playing somebody who is really damaged by abuse, and you know that this it's a character." Here it makes psychological sense, right? It's not just there for the sake of being there the way it was throughout the decade. It, like, it wasn't pleasant and it doesn't it doesn't actually tarnish the movie to me because it comes from a place and what's interesting, I mean, Morris, <laughs> I mean, sorry, Jerome throwing, throwing that woman who's coming after Morris in the dumpster, not great. But not great. it's in the spirit of what assholes Morris and Jerome already are. Right. Right. Like they're a particular kind of cartoonish asshole. Prince is like a psychological asshole. And so a lot of the ways in which that psychology manifests itself is through the treatment of women, unfortunately. Um, But that doesn't feel far fetched to me. That feels very much within the logic of the pathology, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, We've, we've come through with this problem a few times, not a problem, but uh, this, Thing with the rewatchables where it's like hey it's a movie this is art these are characters like sometimes not every story can be palatable um and Prince yeah was, when you get enough of these 350 something movies right i mean you're gonna have a couple of them prince with the puppet is weird i've never really 100 percent understood it uh oh i love that moment well is he actually do it doesn't seem it seems like he's they're dubbing really in his voice right. i yeah, know it's, that's it's, why i'm like why <laughs> why do this if he can't actually do ventriloquist stuff but it's so dark. I mean, I don't know. It, I is dark. Real, it does get weird. I mean, I don't know. It's just really, really dark. And, uh, and, and instructive, too. What stage the worst? Des Dickerson in the Modern Airs. This was sadly the peak, and then he didn't make the album. I love Des's headband. That's my favorite thing about Des. I hate the cutaway in the last song to Morris and Jerome dancing. Hmm. In the crowd. It's like, mm-hmm. you've just set up mm-hmm. this amazing beef between these guys for... Two hours. Now they're just in the crowd like, yeah, go get him, kid. He but just said the meanest thing ever 15 minutes ago. I know. Yeah, This is professional wrestling to me. It's like, I'm, I, oh, right. I forgot. These guys don't really hate each other. Right. It's, well, when you say that has the family line, that's pretty rough. That's, Prince and Apollonia. That's uh, the chemistry, we don't know what order it was filmed. <laughs> that, right, true. The chemistry of Prince and Apollonia, the looks at each other is good, but when they have actually have to act, I mean, there's an incredible casting, what if, so just, I'm going to plant the flag on that and we're going to come back to it. And then, um, Prince's movie career, which you, you've, you're on the pro side of, but, uh, to call purple. I'm, Rain not, the, I'm not on the pro. Well, you like, you like graffiti bridge, which puts I you do. in I a do. minority, <laughs> um, but he did under the cherry moon. He did graffiti bridge, which there's, Part of Graffiti Bridge, because I haven't seen it since it came out, but it was in Wikipedia, it said, making matters more interesting is the arrival of Aura, an angel sent from heaven to sway yeah. both Morris and the kid into leading more righteous lives while dealing with their attraction to her. And I was like, no wonder I blocked that movie out of my mind. That right. sounds awful. But yeah. it was like, it's basically the unofficial sequel to this movie. So uh, Prince did say this about Graffiti Bridge in 91. One of the most purest, one of the purest, most spiritual, uplifting things I've ever done. Nonviolent, positive, had no blatant sex scenes. Maybe it will take people 30 years to get it. They trash Wizard of the uh, the Wizard of the Oz first, too. Um, 
We're 33 years in. I still don't get it. Um, so there you go. Uh, what's age the worst? I love it. This is really for you and five other people who will 100% get this. But <laughs> my most, my two most upsetting 80s funk band, why didn't this go even better than it did or the time and the bus boys? Oh, I just don't. Why? Why the do the bus, bus boys, boys just have to peak at, for, at Vromans with those two songs? Those songs mm. were great. Anyway, I don't um, know what happened, but this is a great question. I haven't thought about the bus boys since it yeah, happened. Go watch wow. 48. They have two songs in a row in 48 hours yeah. and they crush yeah. it. Yeah. And then uh, Morris Day apparently was a problem on the set. Unclear why. Rivalry with Prince, maybe some off the set stuff. But uh, yeah. He seems difficult. I mean, like young Morris just, I mean, young Morris is a, is cute. He's a light skinned black man, which is, you know, I mean, it is a real magic carpet ride for some of those guys. <laughs> I mean, and he's got those great freckles. Um, and it's true. Like the movie sort of builds him as a per, like an object of lust in the public, right? Like women coming up to him being like, you didn't call me last week. And him being like, <laughs> He's the latest I don't man. care. Right. All right. Some quickie categories. The Mallory Rubin Award. Did this movie need a better sex scene? We don't get to give this out that often. We get Prince from behind really taking some liberties with Apollonia. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of shocking that this was uh, the 11th biggest movie. That it's like he's kind of got her hand on her pants, but then it doesn't really go further. And then we see them in the barn for a split second, but the rumors have always been that there was a pretty heated sex scene that uh, got left on the cutting room floor in the barn. I, th I think I mean, we're good. I believe it. I also think that, I mean, this is some of the best kissing that you're going to see in a movie. You know, like, mm. I mean, you know, one of my big pet peeves with all, with so many movies is the people kissing can't kiss or they're like, they don't like kissing the person they are kissing. Right. And it just is like, if you're really hot for this person, you are trying to eat their face. And he is trying to eat her face. <laughs> Purple Ray. That, that, is, um, that is real to me. We don't get to give this one out too often, too. The Jamie Lee Curtis Unnecessary Nudity Award. The Lake mm. Minnetonka scene. Yes, yes, yes. The Vincent Chase Award for Are We Sure This Character Was Actually Good at His Job. I got to go with Billy the Club Owner who has Prince in his prime and he's like, I don't know, man, you might have to step it up. The modern ears have one <laughs> song. You might get bumped. But I, I have now this might go in nitpicks, but it's too big a nit to pick. This is the single greatest. This movie is the single biggest indictment of rock journalism, maybe in the history of recorded sound. How on earth could these, this band, let's just say that before you and I and the rest of the audience- I had this in the unanswerables. To Billy's club. How do they not have a record deal and a 5,000 word Rolling Stone profile by now? But Bill, let's just say that like the thing that, like the thing they were doing two years ago was the songs from, were the songs from 1999. Yeah. Like there's no world in which these people with a band this tight with this with these songs isn't the biggest band in the world three years ago. Right. And what is Billy doing by not telling anybody that the band exists? Like it's just there's so much dereliction of duty here that I don't I don't know what to say. Like, is there nobody in Minnesota with a connection to Jan Wenner who's off making perfect at this point? <laughs> this is this is just total rock criticism and rock journalism malpractice on full display here. Couldn't agree more. Ruffalo Hannah Ribbonneck Partridge Over Acting Award. The girl who gets thrown into a dumpster Ugh. is also the worst actress. <laughs> I don't know. She she somebody owed her a favor or something. Like, Morris, how dare you? Like she couldn't be worse. Um, it is film criticism happening on site, which is what I also love. I love it when when a movie is its own critic in some ways. Was there a better title for this movie? I'm going to say no. 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 The Can You Dig It Award for Most Memorable Quote. 
you have to purify your, yourself in Lake Minnetonka. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. The CR thinks Luke Wilson could have been Harrison Ford, hottest take a word. You probably don't have one prepared, but I do. Here we go. Prince was better than Michael Jackson. Oh, Prince no. was a better performer than Michael Jackson. Okay. Purple Rain was better than Thriller. The Purple Rain movie was better than anything Michael Jackson did creatively. Mm. I just had Prince over Michael Jackson as great as Michael Jackson was. I think his peak was higher. Mm. I don't even know if that's a hot take. Uh, I don't I don't think it's a hot take. I mean, I think it like to to a person who hasn't really thought about this, it sounds blasphemous. But when you it's an easy case to make, right? Um, he was just more I, talented. He like he could also play the guitar as well as anybody in the last sixty years. On top of all the other shit, yes, And I yes, think as a yes, stage performer, yes. if you're gonna say like like Michael was an amazing stage performer, but I, if I had to my choice of Michael at his peak or Prince at his peak, who would I have rather seen for two hours? I'm taking Prince. I think the difference. I think the thing that you are sort of alluding to um and i've never seen michael jackson live i never got to see him um i have heard from people who really know that those shows in those giant arenas were some of the best hours of their lives the michael jackson Um, yes yeah i can imagine there being a world having seen prince live a few times where the thing that makes Michael Jackson an extraordinary live entertainer gets tiresome um, because it is built around an old entertainment model, right? An old showbiz model. Um, But at the end of the day with Michael, you just have these songs. And he felt, and Prince didn't have this, but Michael did. Michael would speed up the tempo of the songs live so that they just were different. The thing, the groove mm. is doing a different thing in concert than it is in the studio. Um, I think I would rather watch a movie with Prince and Michael Jackson in some way. Um, but I don't really know that because Michael didn't make enough. You can see in the music videos, if you but watch I don't think the videos, Ma- I don't think Michael could have made a movie like this. No, 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 no. Because Michael There's was no way. really, Michael was really about concealment. And so the the like obviously, the thriller music video is more where Michael was going to go creatively, which is that ended up being his creative right, apex, right, 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 right. But to think if you, ugh, this is a really interesting thing to think about, and there's a thing you know, it's funny that you're saying this because this is a thing that we have been talking about for more than forty years, right? Like who of the two of them is the better X Y Z thing? Um, I would rather listen to Michael sing. For longer than I'd rather listen than, than listen to Prince sing. Prince has got a great voice. He's in yeah, like Michael, the top. I mean, this, he's Michael's in the top fifty. Is, uh, yeah. Michael's in the top ten. Yeah. Um, I think that you're right about the guitar. I think the way Prince thinks about rearrangement, um, you know, mixing and matching songs, like how a band works, um, what a band even is despite the number of bands he's taken apart and put back together and scrapped and built from scratch. Um, I don't know. This is a really deep question. I, I don't really, I don't have a comfortable answer. I definitely will say, uh, I will say that just from the standpoint of the albums, Prince is, Prince is the winner, right? Like Prince, I love dangerous is my favorite Michael album. Um, thriller is the best Michael album, but like for 10 years, 10 years, Bill Prince, was doing masterpieces after masterpieces after masterpieces. And the idea that like the thing that so allegedly breaks the streak is the Batman soundtrack. I'm yeah. sorry. He was throwing, he was doing us a favor with that music. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most exciting movie of 1999. And they had the had music by the most exciting musician in the world for it. It just, it's just crazy to me. Two really good casting what ifs for this. Mm-hmm. After they have everything set up, Warner Brothers in the first minute is like, what if we replace Prince with John Travolta? They were like, no. So that happened. Mm. And then um, Prince mm. wanted <laughs> Gina Gershon to be the girlfriend. 
Wow. This was after Vanity uh. Vanity uh, left. Vanity was in Vanity 6, mm-hmm. right before filming. Nobody mm-hmm. really knows what happens. There, there's the She went to potentially do Last Temptation of Christ, but the movie got delayed. That's a little flimsy. Her and Prince had a blowout because they were dating. Mm. That's a little flimsy. Um, there might have been drug stuff. She had drug stuff her whole life. Mm. Whatever happened, mm-hmm. she pops out. She's supposed to be the Apollonia character. Then it goes to Gina Gershon. She's a freshman at NYU. Prince flies her out to Minnesota, plays the soundtrack for her, and she doesn't want to do it because she because of the sex scene. Ironic. Hmm. Then they offer to Jennifer Beals, who's oh, wow. like, I'm going to Yale. I can't. And now we're in the scrap heap looking for anybody, and everybody liked Apollonia. Wait, looking. isn't so flash dance has already happened? Flash so dance has happened. And she's like, I'm going to Yale. I'm done. I don't know. Okay. Thanks. So there you go. Um, best that guy award. It's probably Billy the club owner, right? He has one IMDb credit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nobody, I didn't know what his last name was till I did the research for the movie. It's Billy Sparks. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's kind of likable, that. like a really kind of. I thought he was fresh, good. I liked him. Plus, he had brought timeless, out the tracksuit. Yeah, he's got a timeless look. Like I yeah. didn't like. You sent me a picture. You sent me a screenshot of Billy, and I was like, this could be from Belly. This could be from like two weeks ago. Right. He could be at like at a basket. He could be at like a like a Lynx game. Dion Waiters Award. I have Billy the Club Owner. Mm-hmm. I have Jerome because mm-hmm. I think he's not in it quite enough, so he qualifies. Uh, Morris is in Definitely. it for much. Jill the waitress. Wendy and Lisa are in this movie a lot. I don't know if they qualify either. And then I have the club announcer, the weird guy mm. that comes in and just goes. Oh, I love him, ladies and gentlemen. The time. Um, he's out of cabaret. That guy is straight up out of cabaret. I think the answer is Billy. Yeah, it's Billy. Okay. It's not Recasting even couch director city. I, I would not touch any of this. Would I would. You, what would you cha- change? I had a really interesting thought about, um, like, just like work with me here. How different a movie is this if Apollonia can actually give a performance, right? I mean, because I, I think the thing that makes the movie great is that ultimately the great performances all happen on stage, even hers, right? She comes alive on stage. Yeah. Um, not as alive as Morris Day and the time and, and Prince. I would argue but- she comes alive on Lake Minnetonka. That's not actually Lake Minnetonka. <laughs> That's your that's your thirteen year old self talking. Yeah. That's not that's not reality. Fifteen, <laughs> whatever. Um, what happens if a if Eliza Minnelli gets this part, right? What happens if like you don't give it to like just some beautiful woman? You give it to an actress. Well, what who, happens if Vanity gets it? She could actually act. I don't, and was I don't one know. of the most beautiful women of the eighties. Yeah, I just wonder what happens to this because the part has clearly been written to stand independent of Prince. Right? We are watching Prince from her point of view, but we're mm. also experiencing her life without him sometimes. And I, I don't know. I just wonder. I just if don't know probably- who the actress. I don't know who the actress was in nineteen eighty four who could have done it. Unless she wanted to go Madonna, which would have probably broken the universe. (laughs) 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 Uh, (laughs) It just would have brought in fire and crows. Um, They did wind up working together for one song on um, Like a Prayer, one of my favorite Madonna songs. What sports announcer would you want doing the director's commentary? Tony Romo, Chris Collinsworth, somebody else. I'm going to give you, uh, this is clearly Tony Romo. Oh, it's, yeah. It's clearly the darling Nikki scene. Oh, Jim, the kid isn't happy. <laughs> oh, he's breaking out darling Nikki. <laughs> She's in a hotel lobby masturbating with a magazine, Jim. <laughs> this is going to get ugly. <laughs> She's ready to grind. I will listen to Tony Romo. Yeah, well, it's football season. We got to bring Tony back. That, yeah, he's going to give us a lot of mentor. Um, half ass in her research. The movie was originally much darker and they had deleted scenes like the sex in a barn. They had mm. Prince going to Apollonia Six's rehearsal and actually fighting with members of the time. Like a, that like sounds, a fist fight. 
That sounds um, out of Prince's out of Prince's uh, behavior book. They had uh, Prince's mother talking to him. They had a whole scene about his relationship with the father. They just they cut all of it and kept it going. Hmm. Prince in real life dated Wendy's twin sister Susanna for like mm-hmm. a year. Mm-hmm. Not a good, not a good situation there either. The kid never said a word to Morris in the whole movie. Yeah, Morris says eighteen words to the kid. Yeah, that yeah. it's all Steve McQueen, no dialogue shit. Um, it's a real flex. That's a real, real flex. Just, Darling, I'm not even. Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm not even saying dialogue to Darling Nikki. Started the whole Tipper Gore. Um, sexually explicit lyrics thing. Literally was ground zero for it. Her 11-year-old daughter was listening to Darling Nikki. Tipper Gore freaked out, <laughs> Al Gore's wife. And we were off. And and it eventually led to warning labels on music because she was masturbating with a magazine, Jim. <laughs> so Can we talk go. for a second about how good that song is, though? It's fucking and amazing. It's a great song. And I don't, everybody who who listens to it multiple times in their life has a probably has a different moment when it hits them what what musically is happening here and for me there's the kick drum sequence where like i didn't understand what was going on there until i was maybe you were 35 okay i was a, i was definitely an adult i was driving in a car with my friend donnan and we were listening to the soundtrack and we both like he almost crashed the car because it hit us at the same moment that like Holy shit. This kick drum is exactly what it sounds like it is. <laughs> this this rapid fire kick drum, it just I don't know. Hats he off. does some cra- we I didn't mention when we did they when we did that scene. Just Prince athletically on stage was pretty oh great. Oh my god. He oh throws god. the mic down at he throws the mic down at one point and then f- jump falls down and then sings it in the microphone and it's like I don't know. He's like a magician. Of course he was on painkillers. I mean, you watch this movie and you totally understand what toll it took on his body right. to be He's that jumping athletic. two feet down, wearing like five inch heels. Apex Mountain, Prince is maybe the all-time example of Apex Mountain for this because the, the album's already out. The movie becomes a huge hit. This is about as apexy as it gets. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Apollonia, no question. The time, no question. Minnesota sound, no question. Minnesota. No, come on. Okay. All right. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'm just thinking about Jimmy and Terry and Janet, but that's fine. Minneapolis and Minnesota just as a city and a state. It's it's conceivable. I don't know if people go 87 twins. What's I was gonna ask, like, what is happening? Sports wise, not awesome. Yeah, it's my it's basically more music movies, but Kirby Puckett's coming. Like okay. they're, I think they win the 87 world series. Oh, they're man. about to get a team like shit's happening. Magazine masturbating unquestionably apex mountain. The first <laughs> Avenue nightclub. Yeah. Still, still kicking, doing great. Yeah. Cl- yeah. Clarence Williams, the third, no riding a motorcycle with five inch lifts. Absolutely. Apex mountain Lake Minnetonka, which wasn't actually Lake Minnetonka, but I still feel right. like it's apex mountain. Prince's customized Honda Matic Honda CM 400A motorcycle. Yeah. Uh, which I mean, changes, changes, uh, kind of changes during the movie, becomes a different motorcycle. I noticed. Oh, does it? Yeah. Uh, and that's about it. We hit everything. Is that okay. a motorcycle that we see in movies very often? I mean, I don't know. It's it okay. it from 1981. Okay. Cruz or Hanks? For the lead role, Cruz. <laughs> Hanks. Hanks as the kid would be the weirdest fucking movie of all time. Uh, Cruz, Cruz could, Cruz could oh at least God. give it a whirl and be crazy. He, he would have, I mean, he would have really, I mean, the thing about this movie is how would you even, how dare you even think about recasting it? Like, because the, no, one of the can't. greatest physical performances anybody's ever given I'm in saying a movie. gun to your head. It's like, you, right. well, you oh, have I mean, to, it's got to be. Sure, you pick Tom Cruise, but. Racehorse rock band wrestler or fantasy team name. It's either Lake Minnetonka or the Modern Airs. The Modern Airs is a pretty good fantasy team name. I think that's a really good professional wrestling, 80s professional wrestling The Modern Airs. Here they the are. The Modern Airs. Yep. They're dressed like yep. this. They become the Rock and Roll Express, but they start as the Modern Airs. Pick a nits. 
Why did the kid live at home? <laughs> He's fucking crushing it at First Avenue. Like he can't get like a one bedroom apartment in downtown Minnesota. Um, that is some real carry business. I mean, I think there's so many movie references happening here. Um, I think having him live in the house with the parents is well, really- it helps it helps dramatically, but it's ridiculous. Yes, yes, yes. Why would Apollonia leave New Orleans to go to Minnesota for music? <laughs> what was she hoping for? She was just like, I'm in on the funk sound. New, New mean, Orleans isn't a lively enough musical place to start my career. I, Phil, I need to- I'm telling you, she is running from something and we, the movie just doesn't ask why. It's a great call. What. Yeah. Well, we know she didn't steal money from anyone because she's only $37. Uh, I think jumping into the lake and then getting out a motorcycle is like, you'd get something worse than 2020 COVID. I, I don't even know what kind of level of pneumonia you would get from that. You would get some level of pneumonia that hasn't been invented yet. We should just try it. Uh, I so mean, somehow I think she the pneumonia that. is called Morris Day in this movie. Right? Really? Like, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Apollonia lives in the cheapest hotel possible, but then somehow has enough money to buy Prince a guitar. That's like in the window. Know. Like, I don't know how that happened. The dad, the gunshot to the head, and he clearly in the script and in the movie was supposed to die, but the studio throw, threw themselves in front of that one. But there's a chalk outline like he died. Wait, but then Warner he's in the Brothers hospital. Stopped a, yeah, they're like, the you're not killing. Black man? Oh. Well, apparently, right. um, 80s Warner Brothers. You'll love this. This is some deep, boring movie history, but Star 80 the year before which did not perform well. Mm -hmm. And they were like, one of the reasons it didn't perform well was just too gruesome at the end. So you can't mm -hmm. have the dad kill himself. So he's in the hospital and he's kind of like alive. Yeah. But we have the montage. Prince goes, and there's a chalk outline on the floor. Yeah. Like yeah. he's dead, I, but he's not dead. It's so bizarre. Come on. It's so bizarre. It, just, it makes no sense. By the way, they, they did that, that brief shot of Prince hanging. So they, oh. they put him up there and they put him on a harness and they had somebody sway him to make it seem like he was hanging and Prince freaked out. It was like his worst nightmare. He had like had a panic attack. That whole sequence is so dark. Like, it really is. There is so much going on there. His brief flash of seeing himself hanging from the rafters of his of the Keeps basement. looking at the rope. I mean, it's just... One. All right, here's the big one, Wesley. Unless do you, I have one giant one, if, unless you have any more nitpicks. Mm. So how did they play Purple Rain without rehearsing it? This is an interesting thing to get hung up on. Go on. He's like, this is a song from Wendy and Lisa. They're like, whoa, he's playing our song. They've never heard the song. They've never heard lyrics with the song. They've never arranged it. They just break into one of the great rock anthems of the 80s that gets a seven-minute standing ovation. He doesn't turn, talk to the synth person, the drummer, nothing. They don't know mm. what the song is. So I assume we're supposed to think maybe they rehearsed this one or two times, but they didn't know he was going to play it, and that scene got cut. Otherwise, this is in impossible. I mean, I love... I mean, I know that it's funny... Because we haven't really worked, we haven't articulated our philosophy of what constitutes a musical. I think you can't be a musical if all the music performed in a movie occurs on a stage. And yet, so many musicals where that is true involve rehearsals. Yeah. We only see one rehearsal in this movie. Right. And I think there's something about to like answer the question that you're asking. I think that the that movie musical and for 1984 music video magic is partially responsible for the suspension, the disbelief, <laughs> some of the disbelief we're supposed to suspend is in it, it involves how prepared these people are to to go out here night after night and do this work. Um it seems to just come from It's them. a big leap. Um, listen, my job is to pick nets. <laughs> it's a big leap. That's all I'm saying. Did I love it? Did I did I have I appreciated it for 40 years? I have. <laughs> Sequel, prequel, prestige, TV, all black cast are untouchable. This movie is obviously untouchable. Untouchable. 
Is this movie better with Wayne Jenkins, Danny Trejo, Sam Jackson, J.T. Walsh, Byron Mayo, Harling Mays, Eva Laughing, Ramon Raymond, or Philip Baker Hall? Can I give you Sam Jackson as Billy the Club I was owner? I just about to say a young Sam Jackson as Billy the Club Wendy owner. Wendy Lisa, I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> the stage is no place for your personal business. Say what again? Say what again? <laughs> I think Sam might be the answer every time, though. Uh, I mean, he could have been a good Jerome, too. I mean, I Sam don't could know. have been in this movie. Like, he, yeah, he, he could, have been could have been a bunch of different movie. parts. Just one Oscar who gets it, the soundtrack. Okay. Probably unanswerable questions. How would you describe Jerome's actual job? Valet? He, yeah. I mean, classically speaking, he's the valet. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, but you know, I mean, it's funny because in a movie like this, there's so much insecurity and desperation and sadness, and they don't all, all the desperate people don't know that they are desperate. Morris is so pathetic and so tiny yeah. and in his, in his like self-presentation, like in, in the meaning of his self-presentation that it's just so crazy to me that Jerome could be even smaller. Than, right. than Morris, Jerome's right? like, I'm going to attach attach myself to this dude. It's really do you fascinating. Think, do you think the kid had a thing with Jill the waitress? Yeah, of course. 100%. I think that there's just something about... Well, I mean, first of all... Because when Jill she's Jones, crying at the end, is she crying because... Those might be real tears, Bill. I mean, I, I think that... She's crying because she wasn't playing the Apollonia part? I mean, I think she's crying because Prince didn't treat her that great. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, did they, they, I think those two characters in the world of that movie definitely had a relationship. It's an unspoken one. Yeah. And she's kind of hanging around. Um, what does it really sound like when doves cry? <laughs> Is that what it sounds like? A guitar? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Did Billy eventually kick out the Modern Airs or Apollonia 6, if you had to guess? He only had spot for three bands. Oh the my kid God. grabbed his spot back. I feel like the Modern Airs, but Apollonia 6 just coming out playing the same two songs for a year. I mean, Des could kick it. Des, I would have kept the Modern Airs. You keep, you keep the Modern Airs. Can you really masturbate in a hotel lobby with a magazine, or would you get kicked out? I feel like you'd get removed. Um, have you seen the hotels that were at, like the hotels in New York like, City? De depends on the hotel, Bill. Sometimes that's not enough to get a room. All right, I have one more big one. Unless you have any unanswerables, this is you're going to love this last one. Was "Darling Nikki" the first diss track? <laughs> <laughs> so I went back and I researched all the diss tracks before we hit the mid eighties. Sweet home, Alabama was yes, Leonard Skinner's yes. diss track of Neil Young. Neil Young. Yeah. Yeah. How do you sleep was the, the, uh, Harrison diss track of, uh, John Lennon. Mm, mm. But then you have to go all the way back. The first diss track ever. There's actually an answer. It's Yankee Doodle Dandy. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, of course. What am I yeah. thinking? That created the diss track. I don't think a lot of people realize that. And Stephen I know I didn't Foster realize it for this it. weekend. Yeah. Stephen Foster invented yeah. the diss track. That's right. It, it led to... It, some invented a some lot say it too. led to the Drake Kendrick battle this summer. <laughs> Best double feature choice. Would you go 8 Mile or would you go Graffiti Bridge? Hmm. I think for fun to be had in an evening, I'd go Graffiti Bridge. I think for on-the-nose accuracy, you do 8 Mile. If I'm going to a movie theater for a double feature, I need to go Purple Rain than 8 Mile. And especially because you're going to watch 8 Mile and go, wow, they really ripped off Purple Rain. Wow. They're pretty shameless. Yeah. 8 Mile would have to go first, obviously, if you're going to oh, do you it. Think? I mean, oh, yes. You can't. Yeah. How can you end? You can't end. Yeah, you can't. Uh, Purple Rain, you're right. Purple Rain can't go first. No. no. The Indian Red Zawantaneo Award for what happened the next day. I'm going to guess the kid became a massive star. And Apollonia was probably back in New Orleans in like nine months. 
you're a fool. There is no way. Like, if it hasn't already happened, Bill, why is it going to happen tomorrow? Like, did you see all the people lined up backstage? There were like agents, and I don't know. There was a lot. I think it happens. I just think it was a belated thing. Come on. I don't know. I, all right. I, 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 I'd like to think. I'd like to think. But it's crazy because the next, his next stint at that club would be the music for Around the World in a Day, which is not doing any of what Purple Rain is yeah. doing to an audience. But that was, that was a self-sabotage album, though. I mean, I love that. It's got Raspberry Beret. It's got Tambourine, which is good live. Um, it's got a, it's got uh, Around the World in a Day. Um, I really like that album. The latter. Anyway, go on. <laughs> you just made a face. That face was like, I don't, I Come don't on. know what you're talking about. It's, it's Purple Rain was the album before it. Uh, what piece of memorabilia? <laughs> what piece of memorabilia would you want from this movie? I can give you the bike. I'll give you the guitar. I give oh. you the jacket from the Purple Rain scene. Oh, I give you the guitar there's... from the Purple Rain scene. Probably the jacket from Purple Rain scene, right? Be um, a little tiny jacket. I want the hair. The hair. I want Prince's hair. That's what. Like wow, it's that okay. is just some of the greatest like impossible hair, impossible Negro hair that you're ever going to see in a movie. <laughs> it just, it just, and people were trying. They were really trying to get that look. You just couldn't. You couldn't do it. Coach Finstock Award, best life lesson. I, the movie wants it to be never get married. That was the most oh, profound yeah. scene in the movie. Um, <laughs> you I, really thought he was going to say something really deep. Yeah, I mean, this like, is never this get is married, yeah. uh, or just keep following your dreams. And then, who won the movie? Prince in an absolute, unequivocal landslide. Okay, the big moment is here. Craig Korobek's going to come in. He has not seen this movie. I'm pretty sure. He's <laughs> that's correct. Like Ten years younger than the movie. And what'd you think? So I, I I understand why this movie is important. I'm not sure it's good. We're not arguing that. Are we arguing that it's good? We're no. arguing Phil that we is. loved watching it. Okay. I, we loved, I, we, I, I don't, I'm arguing that we loved it. Okay, right. all right. Outside of the musical performances, I just, I don't know. I, I struggled. I think part of the reason why, I, I'm watching this, like you said, for the first time in 2024 as a 30-year-old, and I think the cards are a little bit stacked against me. I also think it's because, <laughs> I, I don't think Prince has really resonated with my generation as well as others from the 80s have. See that, Craig is right, and that's one of the most upsetting things about, that's why we had to spend two hours doing this podcast. His it's music is not resurfaced in a way that others from the 80s, Michael Jackson, Madonna, whoever else, like later ABBA, and all the one-off mm. big hits from the 80s. Those Some songs of the disco are all, stuff. Yes, that's all back in a huge way at bars and stuff like that. And maybe I'm missing it, but there's, there's just not a lot of Prince. I had never even really seen Prince perform in his heyday. I had never gone back to look at that. So when I saw the opening scene of this movie, I was like, wow, I kind of get it. I get Prince yeah. now. Um, yeah. and, but I don't know how many people my age have really, have really watched that. So I you mean, didn't Craig, play Darling Nikki at your wedding? <laughs> I, I had never heard of that song. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, I don't know. I, I think I sent like a screenshot, uh, to my boyfriend who was a, who was like in your age area, Greg, Craig. And, uh, I don't think he, he responded in like with a, with a little bit of surprise. Um, I mean, he, we, we listened to a lot of Prince. He's listened to plenty of Prince, but I don't think Prince is as central. I mean, I think what you're saying is, is true. Um, I think he is a surprise waiting for people to discover, right? Like, I think it's one of the reasons um, we're doing this one. I mean, it, I, this is an absolutely beloved, 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 beloved movie in a certain age range. And I think under 30, probably not. Yeah, would be I, my guess. It's it's a movie where when I watch him perform on stage and I listen to the songs live as he's performing them, I I, I find them to be extremely compelling and entertaining. But I don't want to go put it on and listen on Spotify. It, hmm. Like I do not. I'm not wow. going to take these songs with me. They don't they don't stick to me. I don't know if it's the specific style of that of that version of pop uh, in the '80s. But yeah, and then outside of this, I mean, this movie kind of feels like a like a 90 minute or a hundred minute music video where it has like this all this ambiguity and prince's acting and there's there's more close-ups of 
of prints than there are close-ups of any actor in the history of movies in this movie. Yeah. I mean, like 20% of this movie is just tight on his face and he's not speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's fair. Yeah. Sign me up. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. It, I watched it with Liz and, and it didn't go over well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that's that stands to reason. I, I, I am like, not surprised. Like, look, this, I think this movie is more interesting to talk about than it is to actually watch uh, outside is, of the performances. That is definitely fair. And I also think that because there is a document called the Purple Rain album, um, it it doesn't, but it's funny because as we're as Bill and I are talking, like I really don't think that the one thing obviates the the pleasure of the experience of listening to or watching the other, right? Like the movie to me stands as its own document of Prince's virtuosity and and yeah. and, and, in, and ingenuity and just actual genius, and the album is doing that but it's sort of showcasing what he can do in a studio um and there's like these are these two extreme representations of what he's good at um ultimately serve a similar function which is just to say like he is the best uh but but michael jackson was going to age better there's no question I think making I, this movie, it's, I mean, making this movie, just making it is commendable. Nobody is putting themselves out there like that. I, I, how about this being the 11th biggest movie of 1984? Yeah. But I don't think, but I think what Craig is getting at is interesting too, because I think that, I mean, this is a movie about a persona, right? This yeah. is a movie about the, the, the construction of an, of a sort of public identity based on private experience. So he is taking things that has happened that have happened to him and is building a mythology around them. And he was right. That movie did sort of overwhelm our, our ability to understand who this guy is as an artist. I just don't think there's anybody making music right now under the age of 30. Prince was 26 when this movie came out. Yeah. I don't think there's anybody under the age of 30 who could introduce himself to the world with this this much risk um and virtuosity in the same way that prince does here i, I don't first of all that, nobody would give correct. him money but i yeah. also don't think anybody could there's nobody making music right now who uh, who can do that i think that's right I, I don't tell. think there's any interest from any young artist to do that the risk is too high the upside's not there Possibly. And and in that sense, this movie is a cautionary tale, right? Like it's like you could do that, but then you then you would have made your own purple rain and you'd spend the rest of your career trying to get past it. But it's not as Yeah, like can Prince, you imagine Taylor Swift making her version of this? She would never do it in a million years. She's well, gonna no, play a, she, a fl really super flawed character and you know, writes write all this music for it. She's also a different point in her career, I guess. Um, also, Bill, she's just doing what you just said in the music, right? Yeah, right. I don't think there needs to be like a an movie, an accompanying movie. Component. Yeah, you're right. 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 All right, we got to go. Wesley Morris, a pleasure as always. Great to see you. Craig Horlbeck produced this podcast. Great to see you as well. You can watch us on the Ringer Movies YouTube channel as soon as this goes up, and we will see you next week on the Rewatchables. Mm -hmm.